You are listening to the Kelly J. Norman Podcast. Your life is meant for more, from inside your home to the boardroom. You can raise your leadership, your life. You are meant for living to leave a legacy. How will you leave yours? Now, here's Kelly. So, hey, Curtis, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am so excited to have you on this podcast. So you and I met, oh my gosh, how long ago was that? A lot. I mean, I remember Brady and I rope in the fast lane when he couldn't even get on a horse yet. Yeah, so, so I mean, he was like five, four or five. He's just going to be yeah, 26. Hutch. <laughs> yeah, in Hutch, Kansas. I remember that That's at the crazy. fast lane booth. Yeah, I bet he was like four. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. So that would be Curtis 22 years ago. Do you feel, do you feel old? (laughs) That does. I know that does not seem like it's been that long. So we met in the team roping world and and you were um, traveling with Alan. Is that right? You were with, were you with the forever Cowboys? Yeah. No, I wasn't. I was never actually with forever Cowboys. I moved in with Alan Bach when I was 17 and so I was like really tapped into the, I did, I went to the young pro camps, which okay. I know we, I was around you more than also. Cause it was like when I was really little and then again at the young pro camps. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you that don't, are not in the rodeo world, uh, we were in the team roping world. And so my son, my family, we, we team roped and Curtis used to team rope and that's how we met. And Alan Bach, a world champion, a uh, great man, loves the Lord, and was pouring into you. So I, uh, I have watched you all throughout the years, and I have you, you always were exceptional. And I knew that you were going to do great things. And so sitting on this side of it all, it's like, yeah, I knew it. There you are. You did great things. But there's a little bit of an in-between story, and that's what one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on today, and we're going to finish and we're going to talk about our daily habits because you're such a pro at that. But I just, I would love to give it over to you and you just tell me your story and ever so everybody can glean from that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like I'm like an 80-year-old and a 30-year-old's body because uh, I've lived a lot of life in a short period of time. Um, so I was born and raised in Kansas. Uh, we had horses, roped, did all that stuff. And I had thought my entire life that I was going to rope for a living. Like that was my quote unquote destiny. That was what I was supposed to do. And so Right when I graduated high school, literally the day after I graduated, I loaded up my truck and trailer and moved to Alan Box house. And I was going to drive for him that whole summer to kind of like learn stuff and, like you know, all of that. Over. Yeah. And so um, I did that. And then um, he did a real, uh, it was his first month long camp he did right after that. And we were all kind of the same age that came down, but uh, Paul Eves and Anthony Lucia, Will George, there was a few of us that we ended up staying at Allen's because I was supposed to go to college in Oklahoma. And I was just like, I don't want to leave. And so there were five of us that were just sleeping on his living room floor for months after this camp. And he had finally came to us and was like, hey, if you guys are going to stay here, you can keep your horses here, but you need to find your own place. (laughs) So it ended up there were six of us that lived in a two bed, one bath house. And it was just like a couple miles down the road from his, but we just roped. That's all we did. We just, that's how we paid our bills. That's how we did everything. We sold horses and roped. And so I thought like, this is my stepping stone to get, you know, to start rodeo professionally. And I did that for about a year, but, um, it was August of 2008. I was at a pro rodeo in Coffeyville, Kansas, and, um, it was a two header. So rope that night, that night we had went to the bars and I, decided to drive back and I was driving back one of my friend's trucks. It was a brand new Dodge. And 
thank God he had gotten a ranch hand grill guard put on the front of his truck that day or that, that same day. And as when we were driving back, we could see the fairgrounds from where we were driving from. It was just like 300 yards down the road. And we got hit head on by a drunk driver going 93 miles an hour. And um, he had hit us to commit suicide. And he wrote a suicide note that said he was killing himself and putting someone else out of their misery. So his goal in hitting us was to kill whoever else um, was driving. I still, it, it took me 12 years before I could ever talk about that. Um, it, and it still, it's, it's pretty difficult to even talk about, but, um, yeah. So when I got out of the truck, my, our truck had cut him in half. And so the top half of his body was laying on the ground when we got out of the truck and, it was, um, I w- I was driving, so the police officer, he was being chased by a cop, and the police officer put me in his truck, took me to jail, but didn't, like, arrest me. He basically let me get sober, is what happened, because he knew that this guy had hit me, but if I were to blow over the legal limit, I would be charged with vehicular manslaughter. Wow. And so basically this guy like saved my life, this cop that I didn't even know. And after that happened, um, I was hurt really bad physically. Like I still have back problems and stuff from it, but it really messed me up emotionally and mentally. Like I had horrible night terrors for a long time. Like we were still all living in that house and the guys took turns sleeping on a cot in my room because I would wake up in the middle of the night, just like going crazy. And they would take turns, like waking me up out of it. And so I didn't rope for quite a while after that. And that was kind of like this wake up call to me of, I had really glamorized the rodeo world and like what it would be like to rodeo professionally. And then I got into it and literally every big pro guy that I was around every day that I got to knew, all of them said, if you can do anything else, do anything else. And so it was just kind of like, wow, like this is really hard. Like yeah. you don't make a whole lot of money. It costs a lot of money. You're always gone. And so it was like that wreck was kind of this like wake up call in my life of, do you really want to do this? Which also was like a huge death in my life because it was all I'd ever wanted to do. Right. And so, um, I went through this period there where it was like, I was just very, I just felt very lost. Like I was really hurting physically. I was hurting emotionally. I couldn't rope and I didn't really know what to do. And so I took a job at NRS at National Roper Supply. Um, One of my, one of the guys I roped with a lot, he worked there and he hired me to work in the call center. And I went to work there making $8 an hour. And so I went from, you know, roping every day, didn't really have a set routine, traveling all the time, like had really no structure in my life to working eight to five, making $8 an hour. And that was very hard too. But Taking that job, it introduced me, the guy that owns NRS is David Isham, and then the general manager of NRS at that time, I got to know both of them, and they were the ones who really taught me business to begin with. And I started to realize that, okay, I lost roping, I'm not going to do this anymore, but... I can replace that, like the camaraderie, the competition, like all of these 
things that I loved about roping, I can replace those with business. But I, I was still working this job. And so I didn't really know what to do, but I was reading all of these books that like, I, that was when I started reading like personal development and business books was when I was at NRS. So it was like, it was a very hard time for me in the sense of it was hard working a job and all of that, but it was also kind of like this it was almost like going to college, really. Like I just spent so much time reading different books and learning different stuff about business. And so it was also really good for me. And I made a lot, a lot of really good relationships from my time at NRS. I worked so many different jobs. Like that was one of the things I loved that they did for me was they was like, you know, if you can learn all these different aspects of how we run this business, it's going to help you for the rest of your life. So I answered phones for a year and a half. Um, I worked in receiving, I worked in shipping. I did all of our product knowledge videos. I mean, we were making videos on the internet in like 20, 2008, 2009, when nobody else was doing that. And you can still look me up on YouTube and (laughs) there's all these videos of me. We have like these big microphones as like a necklace Uh hanging around me. And I'm like teaching how to assemble a rope and dummy and all this stuff. I have to go check that out. (laughs) Yeah. they're Every once in a while, somebody will send me a video and they're like, I don't know how I found this, but your video just popped up. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. (laughs) So I, I, when we were talking earlier, I told you like my life verse is Romans 828 because all things work together for good. And my life is this story of building and then everything I thought that I wanted just gets ripped out away from me. And then I rebuild something else. Mm -hmm. And it's why it's hard for me to make like five-year goals because every five-year goal I've ever made is not the same in just even three years. Well, I I, want to say something really quick here and then I want you to go on. But I think you said a word that was so important because you rebuilt. You're successful because yeah. you rebuilt. Yeah. And and so many times when we when things are ripped out from under us, w- the temptation is to lay lay there in it. Did yeah. you did you ever have that temptation or was it just built into you like I'm going to get up? Oh, I, I mean, I think of like right off the bat initially every time it's you're it's just natural to just want to just kind of lay there in it for a while. But I've also learned that my favorite kind of people and really the best kind of people are people who have been through some hard stuff. Because what happens is people either go through a really hard thing and they lay in it forever and become a victim of it. And everything that happens in their life is because this happened to me. Because this happened to me, I can't do this. This happened to me, I can't do that. And when you go through hard things, you either stay in it or you rebuild. And in that, like, not only the rebuilding, but also the going through the hard thing makes you more empathetic. It it really just, like, it makes you a better person in general. So even though I don't want to go through any of those things again, like I'm grateful that I did. Yeah, that's cool. You know, John Maxwell, he wrote a book and it said some people uh, win and some people learn. And so when we walked through something and we didn't get to win on that, whatever it is, that team rope and dream or whatever, but I know that you learned. And it's that learning that built the blocks to where you are now. So go on with your story here. Cool. So. Um, I was working at NRS. I loved it. Also at that time, a lady I worked with had gotten a house in a divorce. This was in 2009. And she was just kind of like crying about it one day and was like, I I, I end up getting this house and I don't want to go back there. And 
blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know anything about real estate, but I was just like kind of talking to her and I said, well, you know, what do you want for it or whatever? And she said, well, I owe 40,000 on the mortgage. If somebody would just pay that off, I would just get rid of it. And so I was like, well, what is it? And she was like, well, it's four bed or it's on a two bed, two bath on four acres in Decatur. And it had a little barn and it was fenced. And I was like, oh, okay. And so the next day I called in sick to work and I went to every little bank in town asking for a loan to buy this house. And I had never had a credit card. I, I mean, I had no credit at all. And the old man that was the president of this little bank, he said, look, I can't give you a loan, but I'll give you a personal loan if you will start banking with us. So it was a mobile home as a two bed, two bath mobile home on four acres. I bought it for $40,000 and my payment to him was $213. And so I bought this and I was like, I'm set. I can now, I now have my own place for 200 bucks. Like, this is awesome. So I moved in there and then one of the books that somebody told me to read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where they talk about assets and liabilities. And it was just, I was literally listening this, to this audio book, driving down the road. And I was like, I do have an asset. I have this house. And so I thought, well, maybe somebody will rent my house. So I took pictures of it and put it on Craigslist for $1,200 a month. And my phone just started blowing up. And I was like, oh my gosh, somebody will actually rent my house. But I didn't have anywhere to go at that time. And so I took it off and I kept living there. And fast forward, the girl who I dated the whole time that I lived down there and everything else, she got a job in Oklahoma City. So it was kind of like we were getting to the point where like we should get married. It it was just kind of that in between time. And she wanted me to move to Oklahoma. And I was like, I will never like Oklahoma. I know I will never like Oklahoma. I like my job here. You know, I'm making 35,000 a year. I I'm happy. Like I think life is pretty well figured out. But I decide, all right, I'll move to Oklahoma. I'm not going to sell my house. I'm just going to rent it. So I'd move up here completely thinking I would hate it and I'd move back to Texas. Well, move up here and I had gotten a job to work with Chesapeake. And the day that I was moving up here, that I had all my stuff packed, moving to Oklahoma, They called me, Chesapeake called me, and they had sold all the assets where I was going to work. So I lost my job before I ever even got up here. I remember when that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So I get to Oklahoma City. I have no job. I've quit the job that I loved. And I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. So I start calling around and the wards, I know, you know, them, uh, Terry and Terry, Andrew and all them, they were the only people I knew that lived here. So I called them and he said, well, my brother has this construction company and you can come to work for, I'm sure he'll, he'll hire you do manual labor. And I'm like, great. Okay. Whatever. So I do, I leave this cush job where I'm in the, in an office, in the air conditioning every day to it's August in Oklahoma. I'm wearing FRs, a hard hat and steel toed boots doing manual labor. And if, if somebody's listening, that's not from Oklahoma, it is hot (laughs) in August. Yes. (laughs) It is. You come to Oklahoma in August. I mean, I hope you're coming to the lake or something because it's so hot. Yes. Yes. So I start working for them. I hate the work, but I love the people, just like the greatest people. And I had happened to start with them at this like really great time because they were just getting in to doing oil and gas work. And the company was really starting to grow. 
So after a couple months, I had went into them and just said, look, I can't do this anymore. Like I, I can't take it. My back is messed up. I don't want to keep doing this. Um, and he was like, look, we're growing. And since you knew all, since you had learned all this stuff about how to actually run a big company at NRS, we need your help to actually build this company. And so I was like, wow, okay. So I went and got to work in the office again and we grew huge, really fast. Well, in the meantime, like before we'd even started growing, the girl that I was with, that I thought I was going to marry, the reason I moved up here, whole thing, uh, that doesn't end up working out. That's a whole nother long story, but we'll just say it didn't work out. <laughs> and so again, these are all my plans. They just get crushed. And I kind of had this moment where I was like, well, I could move back to Texas, but I was like, I just, I don't know why. I was still working manual labor at this point. And I knew a few people, but not very many. And, um, but I was like, I don't know why. Like, I just, I want to keep trying it out here and just see how it goes. So keep working. And then, you know, I got to move into the office, all this stuff. Well, I got to be really good friends with this guy who his wife did the interior design at our office. And it was just kind of a random meeting, but we got to be really good friends. And I ended up moving into their guest house. And when I moved in, he was like, look, if you're going to live here, you're going to go to the gym every day. You are going to start eating right. And we're going to get you all new clothes. And I was like, wow. okay. So, oh, and the other thing was he would give me books to read that I had to write book reports on. Wow. And I was like, all right. And so it was literally like moving back in with Alan, but for business. And I was still working this job, but it was just like another level of somebody kind of taking me in and just like teaching me things that I didn't really even know that I needed to know at the time. So still working construction job. At this point, we'd gotten up to like almost 50 people working for us. I was the logistics coordinator. So I was coordinating where all the people went, all the materials we needed, all this stuff. Well, one day I'm with this, with the guy that I'd moved in with and we were with some of his friends and there was this guy there that was just like, I didn't really know him that well or whatever, but I was talking to him and I was like, what do you do for a living? And he was like, I sell real estate. And I said, how do you even do that? What do you mean? And he was like, I mean, you just help people buy and sell their houses. And I said, well, how do you do it? And he goes, well, you just sign up. You do this course online and you can get a license and start doing it. So I signed up to do this online course and started, I started doing it and I got my license, but I didn't really know what to do or how to do it. And I loved my job. Like at this point, the company is really growing. I loved it, the whole thing. So I have my license. One day I'm at a gas station and there's this guy who had come to take roping lessons from us at NRS that I'd met there. In Texas. And I was like. This is when you were in yeah, Texas. In yeah. Texas. Yeah, but I'm living in Oklahoma at this point. And so I'm at this gas station and I said, Gary? And he goes, yeah. And I said, what are you doing here? And he goes, well, I live here. And I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I sell real estate. And I said, well, I just got my license last week, but I don't know what to do. And he goes, oh, man. He said, come over to my house. I, I'll get you set up. So I go over there. And at that point, you know, I was still a cowboy. Like I dressing nice to me was a ball cap, a polo, jeans, and boots. Mm -hmm. And so I'd went over to his house and I ate dinner with him and his wife. And his wife goes, um, what would you wear if you were to go on an appointment with a potential client? And I said, Well, I would just dress nice like this. Uh -huh. 
And she goes, no, you're, you're not dressed nice like that. You need dress shoes. You need this, that, blah, blah, blah. So I joined this brokerage and that weekend I go to Dillard's to buy my first set of dress shoes. I'm in there and there's this older man there that's dressed really nice. And I said, look, I know you don't work here, but I'm buying my first pair of dress shoes and I don't know what to buy. Can you help me? So he's helping me and he goes, why are you buying your first pair of dress shoes? And I said, well, I just got my real estate license and I need a dress nice. He said, well, have you sold a house yet? And I said, no. He goes, well, uh, me and my wife, just decided today when we were driving over here that we're going to sell our house and buy another one. Would you want to sell our house? And I said, yeah, yes. I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but if you'll take a chance on me, I'll do it. And that's how I got my very first client was went to Dillard's and met the guy there. So fast forward, that's, I've gone through all of like the the majority of the stuff now, but, um, I got into real estate and it took off really fast. Um, it, I sold a little over 50 houses my first full year. And my second full year, I sold over a hundred houses and I sold over a hundred houses for, from 2015 till I sold in 2019. Um, but I ended up starting an investment firm. And so I started an investment company with um, this lady that it was like me and her had started at this brokerage at the same time. We'd always like really helped each other and stuff. And this company was huge. I mean, we sold 292 houses in 2019. Uh, we owned about 30 rentals. We built new construction. Um, I mean, it, it, we had a property management company. It was big. Well, when uh, all of that was really growing and stuff, it took a toll on my marriage because I had gotten married in 2016. And um, it wasn't like anything in particular happened. And honestly, like when we got divorced, even the people that were closest to us thought I was joking when I told them, like, they were like, there's no way. And I was, yeah, it act yeah, this is happening. It just, um, like it, it just didn't work. And a lot of it was because I put, all of my time and energy into work. And I had this kind of philosophy that if I just work hard enough and I don't go on vacation, I don't take care of myself and all this stuff now, that then later I will be able to be fun and I'll be able to be somebody that, you know, that can enjoy my money, basically. And, um, it just really took a toll on things with her and honestly with all of my friendships too. Like I was not a fun person to be around. Uh, I made a lot of money and I built a really great company, but everything else around me was not good. And so um, went through the divorce and it was like, when I started going through that, which again, just, things getting ripped out from underneath me. Um, I was paying her a lot in alimony that first year. And my business partner knew that. And basically what ended up happening was I got extorted out of my own company. Um, she started, she lowered our salary. And um, when she had lowered it, it made it to where I couldn't afford to keep paying the alimony and paying my own bills. And every month that I would go back, like we were making a lot of money and it was just being kept in the company because when you're 50, 50, if she says, no, this is the salary I'm getting, like you can't do anything about it. And, um, so I held on as long as I could. And I finally just got to the point where I was like, you know what? 
there's just so much more to life anyways. Like, screw it. If you're going to pay me enough money, I'll get out. So I had agreed to a buyout and it was set up awesome for me. I mean, it was a lot of money up front, getting paid every quarter for three years. And I was staying on to keep running the company. Well, I didn't realize that she had had this set up the whole time because the buyout was set to where, because I was still getting paid so much for running the company, that the buyout payments were really low in the beginning and they got bigger as time went on. So that was the plan, move forward. Well, about a week before COVID hit, I wake up one morning and I can't get into my email. And so I text her, I said, hey, I can't get in my email. And she said, yeah, I'm gonna call you in a little bit. So calls me and says, hey, just letting you know, effective immediately, you are no longer a part of the company. I've let everyone know that you're no longer a part of the company. And also I'm not gonna make uh, buyout payments anymore either. You're gonna have to sue me if you want them. So- And she could legally do that? Well, she didn't. She ended up losing. I mean, I ended up getting the money, but I did have to sue her in order to get it. Um, And so COVID had hit and I lost, I went from making really good money to my income shut off overnight. And on top of that, our buyout agreement had a non-compete in it. And so my attorney was like, look, you need to show that you followed everything to the letter of this buyout agreement. And so you're going to have to figure out other ways to make money until we can get this settled. So I rebuilt. And again, where, you know, I thought that basically I was not retired, but like, you know, I was pretty, I was pretty set. Um, I went from that to no income and COVID hitting like that fast. And so it was just another, like the rug ripped out from under me. And I'm like, all right, here we go again. Like I've been through this before. I will handle it again. And so I did. I mean, I, um, I started doing deals in other cities. Um, I still, you know, I, it wasn't like I was completely broke. Like I, I had, I had some money, um, but I had to restart. And so, uh, I still have rentals. I still, you know, do stuff like that. But now mainly what I do is I coach people one-on-one and then I have a group that actually Brady's in now, which is so crazy at this come full circle. Uh, but I've got a group of about over a hundred people that are all in real estate um, that's become a really, really cool thing. And I look back on my life and now I'm able to see that all of the really terrible, hard things that I went through are all so worth it because I learned all of these things the hard way that I can now help people avoid. Like that's kind of the payoff so to speak for this is like, yeah, you went through some really bad stuff. But now you can help people avoid going through those. And so it's been really cool to see all of that go come full circle. Yeah, that is so awesome. And you know, when we, when we look at, uh, when we even look at scripture and we look at the word and, and I, I feel like God tells us that what you walk through is for you to go and help other people walk through. And so that's kind of the way he he created the kingdom up. As as we escape, as we get out of the pit, then we are to turn around and we get to reach down and help somebody else out. And I'm sure there's been so many people in your life that you've been able to give so much wisdom to, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you don't really get wisdom without going through stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like even like in Proverbs where it's, you know, you can pray for wisdom all you want, but at the end of the day, you get wisdom by going through some really hard stuff. And you know, <laughs> you I, don't I, learn to not go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. 
Well, I was just saying, you don't learn that the stove is hot. If you touch it, it's going to burn your hand until you actually touch it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I know there's somebody listening today and like life stinks right now and you've just walked through something really bad. And uh, I, I hope this brings them hope that they are gaining yeah. wisdom. They are, you know, if they will get back up. Yes. And the thing that I've learned too from getting back up so many times is once you've been through something like that once, even if it happens again, you're not where you were before because you have all of that wisdom and all of those things that you've learned along the way to where you're not like starting from square one. It's like you go up, 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 and then you fall back down a little bit where you're still not down here. You're up here. And it's just easier to keep going. And I think it's really easy to um, listen to the lies when we fall. And I think that's why we stay stuck is our mindset. And so talking just a little bit about uh, what, what we're believing. (laughs) That, I mean, that's a hundred, that, your mindset about all of it now. And I almost kind of laugh now when times get tough or something bad is going on. And it's just kind of like, well, I, <laughs> I've been through this before. Like I'm going to be. Okay. I like what you just said. I've been through this before. I can do it again. And you yeah. know, for my own life, I don't know about you, but I, I tell people that I stay sane by talking to myself. And so what that looks like is I'll have to, I have to train on myself sometimes. I have to uh, tell myself, you've done this before, you can do it again. Or I've told myself this right here, if they could do it, I could do it. Instead of looking at somebody and being jealous, so many times that can even paralyze you is you can look at somebody's success and then you can say, oh man, like I'm such a victim mentality. Only, only, you know, others get to do that. And instead of being jealous, like, no, let them be a place of uh, a big poster board that said, hey, I can do it. You can do it, too. And that's that's what I've learned out of my life is that people's success has showed me what can be done. Yes. Yeah. yeah and I hope that, you know, my story is that for people, because I know, like, you know, you kind of said it earlier, but if somebody is going through that time where you went through a divorce or you lost a business or you got fired or, you know, anything. I know that when you're in that moment, it feels like the end and it feels like my life is over. I can't get past this. It, I know that feeling. I know exactly what that feels like. And I promise you it, it's not, you will, if you just keep going forward, you can rebuild and it will be more beautiful than you could have ever imagined. It really, it really will be because you've learned so many things along the way to make it better as it, as you go forward. And I I found out that true contentment comes from being able to add value to other people's lives because you can make all the money and you can do all the things, but if you're alone and you're not adding value to people, I guarantee you, you're miserable. And so as yes. we're walking through all this, we have something to be able to turn back through something in our back pocket that we can offer somebody else. So I just, yeah. I just, uh, I hope this really encourages people that have like been through the stuff to not give up, to look up to, you know, I like to take everything back to scripture and, you know, it's capture every thought. You got to capture every thought that does not give you life. The scripture says capture every yeah. thought that does not line up with Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is life. And if that is not lining up with life, then you have to replace that thought with the truth. And, you know, some people that are listening are have been in habitual uh, negative thinking. And I, I love Carolyn Leaf. She has several books, one of them, Switch on Your Brain. And she talks about how if you will replace those thoughts with the truth and confess them over your life. So are you very big on affirmations? Um, have you? Mm-hmm. If, yeah. So I, I love affirmations because I, I actually have rewired my brain with with w- what I'm talking about here. And so when you take the truth, what I like to do is I take that lie, I take that lie, and then I look at it, that toxic thought, and it's like this isn't the truth. What is the truth? I find the truth, and when I find the truth, I start confessing that over my life, and and I yeah. speak in that it out loud. Yes. Yes. 
And um, I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday, and uh, our words matter because I bring it back to Scripture, and that is God created the earth with a spoken word. And Scripture says we are created in His image. And I believe that the Spirit of God lives within us. And so if we're created in His image, then we are to speak and create. So um, we are creators. And the, yeah. my, uh, my podcast series has been Created to Dream. And I, I, I do believe that we're created to create. And so, yes. so capturing those thoughts. So coming from a, you're very successful now in your life. Would you say that, you know, that you've been super blessed and, uh, yeah. And I feel like success to me now is a lot different than it was before. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's more of like time freedom is a huge part of it, but at the same time, it's when I went through this last kind of, you know, pullback in 2020, I asked myself instead of every other time I've built anything, it was with making money the center like that, like I had to eat, <laughs> like I had to pay my bills. Uh -huh. And so instead, this time I was like, what do I want my life to look like? And then built a business and everything else around what do I want my life to look like? I start living my life that way of how I want to live. When do I want to work? How many hours do I want to work? All of those things. And then figure out how to make money around how I want to live my life as opposed to, I'm just going to fill every waking hour with work because that's, so that's just what that I've done. So good. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, uh, I've been doing this podcast on dreaming and the last one of the, one of the last ones I made was on creating a game plan. And so that's what I want to, I want to shift just for a second and talk about this with you is when I was creating that podcast, I really feel like God downloaded this scenario with me is creating a game plan is like, where's your starting point? Cause we have to know where we are and where is your finish line? And so for you, you know, you had your finish line with your goals, what you wanted that success to look like. And then the yeah. next step is the distance is like, I know we can't put a timetable on it, but we have to have an idea of how far, how long this is going to take us. And then mile markers in between that. And so on these mile markers is breaking things down in a bite-sized portion to create that strategy on how to get there. Because I think people have yeah. a really big dream and then they have no, they wake up the next morning and they're like, well, I got this really good dream, big dream, but I have absolutely no idea what to do today. And then they wake up the next yeah. day. It's like, I've got this really, let me tell you about my dream. And then they tell everybody about their dream and they wake up the next day and they're looking at a computer screen or a cup of coffee or whatever that is. And they're like, but I have no idea how to get there. And pretty soon it just becomes your fantasy instead of actually a dream that you're moving towards. So when we get that strategy on how we want to move there and break it down, something that fall a, a really important word in there is our ha habits, our daily habits. And I think that when we, uh, when we change those habits and we or create those life-giving habits, so I know you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, to me, if it's important enough for you to do, it's important enough to track. And I think it is very difficult to accomplish anything if you don't have actionable things that you are tracking on a daily and weekly basis. Okay. So for example, like um, anybody who's worked out for any length of time, like, you know, okay, if I'm going to the gym and it's going to be chest day, I'm going to do three sets of 10 of bench press. And then I'm going to do three sets of 10 of incline and, you know, all of those different things. But you're, tr you know what you're doing and then you track it. You know that you did the right amount of things. And it's the same in any area of our life. I am, I've been huge about tracking sheets. I, it's printed off every week and I have done this since 2014. I know exactly what things I need to do on a weekly basis and how many of those I want to do. 
And then each day I'm writing down how many of those things I did. And at the end of the week, I can look at my week and say, I did what I said I was going to do, or I didn't. Because especially in business, it's so, there's so many things that you do that, um, that don't actually add to the bottom line. They don't move the needle. There's, you know, you can get stuck at the bank doing this, or, you know, this fire kind of came up and you spend all day putting out this fire and you get to the end of the day and you're like, oh my gosh, I am so worn out. I had such a stressful day. But if you're not tracking the things that actually matter, then you don't know if you actually did them. Yeah. So going back to habits though, if it's important enough to do, it's important enough to track. And a habit is formed, especially in the beginning, by holding yourself accountable to it by actually tracking it. And if you want to start with something really easy, start by making your bed every morning. Like that is a very, and guys, I get it. You want your wife makes the bed and puts all the pillows up fancy. Learn how to put the pillows up and make your undang bed, okay? <laughs> That's an easy one to start with. And you can just write it on your phone, like in your notes said, make my bed and then put five or seven check marks by it every day to hold yourself. That's releasing some dopamine inside of your brain. It it is programming your brain. And then it's like, ooh, I like to do what I said I was going to do. And let me do this again with something else. (laughs) Well, and at the same time with that, I, I believe that confidence comes from making and keeping promises to yourself. Yeah, that's good. And so you hear people all the time. They're like, well, I just lack self-confidence. You know, I, I don't have enough confidence in myself. And it's like, well, you're not keeping promises to yourself mm-hmm. it's because you're saying I'm going to go to the gym three days a week and then you don't do it or, you know, whatever that thing is. But to make and keep promises to yourself, you just start with something small and that's going to lead to better habits, which over time, those habits are going to just compound into more and more and more good habits for yourself. Yeah, right, right. So I, uh, I love what I do is that is I, um, I even make a list because I know that some of the things that like, especially entrepreneurs, if somebody's out here, your day looks different a lot. But, mm-hmm. but I like to make a list of what I need to do that day, especially on Sunday night for the next week. And then I'll make my list and then I'll come up into Monday. And at the end of Monday, those things that need, I just want to put some practicality to this. The things that did yeah. not get done on Monday, they move to the top of my list on Tuesday. And then I go through my Tuesday and I have my things that, of course, like some of those things are working out. I mean, that's just something I do every day. But if there is something I can't get to, then it goes to the next day's list. And I list it in priority of what has to be done that is so super important. And then everything just rolls to the next day. And so I don't know if that's something that that you've uh, done before. And it's so simple because I talk to a lot of people that are just lost. They're not accomplishing their goals. They're not accomplishing their dreams. They don't know where to start. They know where they want to go, but they don't know how to get there. And so the in-between part of it all is I feel like creating those habits, taking that game, taking that strategy I came up with, with how to get a game plan. Where are you right now? Where do you want to be? What's the distance on that? How long is it going to take? And then breaking that down into to bite-sized portions. I call them mile markers. And then getting a strategy. Yeah. And then I, I ended up with understanding your obstacles. Because uh, yeah. knowing, knowing areas that you're going to get tripped up in before you get tripped up is going to help you also. But I think throughout that, the meat of it all is creating those daily habits and staying faithful with that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I go back with, you know, creating your daily habits of, um, so I do the same thing where I have, it's, I like to write things down because I like to check them off. (laughs) I mean, I just do. Um, I, I write things, but then I also have the notes on my phone. If I'm like not near my desk, whatever. Um, but 
I do another thing that I learned from somebody else that it's called the power list. And so what that means is, sure, you have your to-do list of everything you need to do, but these are the three to five things that are the most important for that day. That if I get these things done, it is a very successful day that I got these three to five things done. Yeah. And what that does for me is it gives me permission to stop working mm. because there's always something to do. There, I love that. You'll never, if you have a business, there's never going to be a time that you're like, well, I got nothing to do. You'll always have things. And so what it does is once I finish those things, it gives me permission to be like, all right, I can either stop working for the day and I can relax without beating myself up because that was my big issue was I felt guilty when I was working for not taking care of stuff at home. And if, and when I wasn't working, I was like, well, I have so much to do. I need to be working. Mm. And so it gave me permission to be like, okay, you got done what you said you were going to do. What was the most important things? And, you know, again, it builds the self-confidence again. You made and kept a promise to myself. And that was because what I think people do with, with their to-do list is they end up doing the easiest things first. Yeah, yeah. It's just human nature. It's just what you're going to do. You put off the things, the hard conversation. You put off the difficult thing that you don't want to do. But when you make that powerless, it's like, these are the things I have to do today. It forces you to do the things that you've been putting off. Right. That is so good. That is so good. Well, I know that uh, I know that you have a wealth of wisdom, and uh, it's so interesting that that Brady has come full circle. For those that are listening that don't know, Brady's my older son, and uh, he also professionally team wrote for a little while, but now he's into real estate, and he's a part of your yes. coaching team. And uh, I'm excited. I know that he has just gleaned so much from that. Um, ending up here, I, I think networking has been huge in your life as I look back on that and the people in our lives. And so I, I, w- you want to end up like speaking into that about how valuable networking has been in your life and how valuable that can be to other people. Yeah. When I think about networking in general, I think about how one of the things that I'm most proud of is not burning bridges with people. You have no idea how full circle life can come in so many areas of life. And if you are good to people all the time, you don't have to look over your shoulder of, you know, oh gosh, it ended bad with them. Or in my entire life, I can think of three relationships that are, that the bridges burned we don't talk anymore. Three people out of all the people I've ever talked to. My ex-wife and I stayed friends for years. Like we're not on bad terms at all. And I think that that is something that people miss is, you know, relationships are hard. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. People are difficult. It just is what it is. But if you can make sure that like, you at least how you end something is how you begin the next thing. And with relationships, if you're burning bridges everywhere you go or treating people badly, it will come back to haunt you at some point in your life. And so for me, it's just like a God-given thing that I've always, I've always just loved to talk to people in general. I just, I love meeting new people Um, I think about, I think it's Paul that said this about, um, oh gosh, I can't remember exactly what the scripture is, exactly what he says, but basically what he's saying is that I love to um, find things in common with people that allows me to talk to them and build a relationship. And that's how I've always been. Like people that I have nothing in common with, I like talking to them or I'm like, wow, I bet I could find something in common with you that we could talk about. And I just think that no matter what kind of business you have, if 
you know, everybody is in sales to some degree. It doesn't matter if you don't own a business or not, everyone is in sales. And you have to get good at building rapport with people. Mm -hmm. And the more people who know, like, and trust you is in direct proportion to the amount of money that you're going to make. But you can't fake that either. You have to learn to actually love people. And if you don't actually love people, it comes off as salesy. People feel it. They know it. And so more than anything, if you don't really love people, you're not going to be good at networking. And so you've got to work on your heart and fix that part first. And then, then you can, you know, do that, but meeting people is so important. Yeah. And when I look at your life, I see how light, you're a very likable guy and um, I can see how favor probably opened doors with you from being nice, from talking to people, from raising up conversations. I mean, like in Dillard's, you're saying, hey, help me with some shoes and you end up listing the guy's house. And so um, I I really like nice people. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I, I really <laughs> like nice people. So, yeah. so you know, if I just told you go be nice, that could open some doors for you. Um, make your bed. Really? Yeah, m- keep your promises to yourself. And uh, one thing that I've told myself lately, I know we're running out of time here, but one thing I've told myself lately is, um, or I told God really, is that when somebody rubs me wrong, <clears throat> because here's the deal, we're all human. We're going to have hard situations. We're going to meet difficult people in business and in school or whatever it is, is that I just tell myself, I'll go low and you go high. I go low and you go high. And so as I humble myself, then I just let God go because he even says he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. (laughs) And he is our vindicator and he is the one. And so many times I feel like we um, inhibit our dreams and our goals from happening because we have to get the last word. We have to have our peace from it all. And that really comes from being a victim because I think when we have a victim mentality, then we feel like that we have to get the last word in. And so I just really like to encourage people is that stay humble, love people, give grace, of course, there has to yeah. be boundaries set sometimes, but but I, I truly believe that when we let God fight our battles, He prepares that table before us. He opens the doors for us, and just go love on the world. Keep your promises to yeah. yourself. Create some daily habits. Get back up. Those are a few things that I got out of our talk today is that don't stay down. And somebody out there right now, you just had something crappy happen to you. You feel like it's the lowest part of your life, and I just want to encourage you. It's not. It's not. You can feel the feeling and you can acknowledge where you are. All that's healthy. But I just want to encourage people to get back up because God has a call upon our lives. God has dreams that are implanted in all of us. And we have to learn the practicalities of all of uh, of how to walk through this. And this is something that really inspires me to help people with this personal development because in the church, I've been in the church a lot of my life. And, and everybody says you have a call in your life. Everybody says you have a destiny. But there wasn't a lot of teaching on the practicalities of how do I get from A to A to B or to C to D? How do I walk this out? And there's just some gold inside of uh, your story and our conversation today that I truly believe that will help people fulfill that call in their life. And, you know, ended up here, uh, I do love the scripture in Psalms, and it says, Lord, you will fulfill your, fulfill your good purpose with me in my life. So here's the deal is that I have been an overachiever. I have been somebody that likes to achieve. And if if you are that person, sometimes you can take the responsibility on that my my destiny is my responsibility. Yeah, you do got to get up. Yeah, you got to make your bed. You got to keep your promises. You got to do those things. But at the end of it all, I'm able to stand and say, God is fulfilling his good purpose in my life. I will not take responsibility for the purpose, but I will respond every day towards that dream. I will respond every day towards that, and I'm trusting God to fulfill that. So I think that um, that making sure that we're not taking the responsibility on for our own fulfillment, that it's our responsibility. No, we just got to, we just got to respond yeah. to be faithful. And because sometimes your purpose or your destiny 
it changes in different seasons. And I think for a long time for me, I put a lot of pressure on myself of, I have to find this one thing. Mm. This one thing is my purpose. And all of my, like everything is so focused on this one thing. Yeah. But I, I have learned through my life that my purpose has been different at different seasons of my life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Because you can look at a lot of people, a lot of like very successful, God fearing, great people that have done the same thing. Even some of the most wealthy people in the whole world, they've done the exact same things. And so don't get so caught up on this is my purpose. And then when that ends, it hurts so much more because it does feel like that was my purpose. And that's so deeply ingrained in you. Your purpose can change and there's nothing wrong with that. I love that. I love that. And I like to tell people sometimes we just got to re readjust our sails. So, yep. We, when the storms come, ride the storms, readjust the sails. And, um, and yeah, I love how God can just use us in so many different ways throughout our lifetime that we don't have to limit that. That's good. That takes the pressure off some people. I know that just heard that. Well, I know that um, we've about run out of time, and I just, once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your story. I know that you're going to come down in May. We're May 6th. We're going to do uh, we're going to do a conference. We're going to do an all-day conference here in Ardmore, Oklahoma. So I'll have some more on that, and you're going to come down and help with that. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, all right, Curtis. Well, you have a, a great evening, and I just thank you again. You too. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. You bet. Thank you. Now you're another step ahead to leaving your legacy. Thanks for listening to the Kelly J. Norman podcast. Follow Kelly on Facebook and Instagram or at kellyjnorman.com. Live to leave a legacy.